All right, thank you very much, uh, everybody. It's really nice to uh, be here. So my, my talk is going to be a bit more technical um, because that's, I'm a technical person. Um, and I, I would really encourage you to ask questions as we go along. So we, there will be a Q&A later, but I, I also enjoy questions as we go along. And it's also useful for me to make sure that you understand what I'm talking about. If I'm saying things that are too simple and too easy, I can go faster. And if it doesn't make any sense, I can try again. So um, just stick your hand up or shout out questions as we go along, um, particularly if it's something that doesn't make any sense to you. OK. Um, so uh, yes, before we start, um, this is about, yeah, obviously this is a more technical talk. This is about what we're doing in Cardano, partly about new features, but a lot of it I'm going to start off with will be about how we're building Cardano um, and sort of the philosophy of, of how we're going about uh, building the software. Um, so just briefly about who I am, um, very briefly. Um, I'm a computer scientist, I'm a programmer. Um, I'm not a marketing person. Um, no BS uh, is my um, motto. Um, I'm the head of engineering for Cardano. Um, I'm, I'm, and I'm also um, a Haskell programmer. Um, I run a Haskell consulting company. I have a PhD in computer science. I've got 10 years experience in Haskell. Uh, no, Haskell consulting, 10 years, and nearly 20 years in Haskell itself. Um, so I've been doing this stuff for a long time, but not, but not cryptocurrencies, actually. Cryptocurrencies are new to me in the last year and a half. Um, so I said we're gonna, it's going to be about what we're building and how we're building it, but actually I'll start with how we're building Cardano, and then later I'll talk about some of the new features that are in development at the moment. Um, so why should we care about software quality? Um, I mean, it's kind of an obvious question, and it's, it, it seems silly to have to ask it, but most software is really bad. And we all know that because we use software and we know it's really bad. Um, so why should we care about software quality when it comes to cryptocurrencies? I mean, the answer is really obvious. If, if you all believe that cryptocurrencies are for real, then you ought to uh, want those things not to fail, right? And if you build cryptocurrencies in the way that we build ordinary software, then they will fail and people will lose billions of dollars or Bitcoin or whatever, right? So failure is very expensive um, in, in this case because it's, because it's money. And at least if you all believe it's money, then, it, then you should believe that it's worth making these systems work. Um, and yeah, industry standard uh, means bad. Um, industry standard practice in, software, in the software industry is terrible. Um, so don't, um, you know, uh, yeah, so we need to aim much better, much higher than industry standard um, to get something that you should have any confidence in. So my question is, you know, if, if someone else is building a cryptocurrency system, why should I trust my money with your system? Why should I trust your system with my money, rather? Um, show me the evidence, right? I don't just want, like, marketing promises and I want evidence, like science, like mathematics. I want proper evidence. That, that's, what I, that's what I would really want, because I am very risk averse. Um, so maybe that makes me a very bad cryptocurrency investor, but probably it makes me a good person to be helping build a cryptocurrency, being, being risk averse. I, I worry. Um, so my question to people building these kinds of systems is show me the evidence. Um, and the opportunity for failure is everywhere. There are so many different ways that systems like this can fail. And so I would like evidence that your system is not going to fail in this way, this way, this way, this way, this way. So let's just go through some of them. Uh, you can have a flawed protocol design in the first place. That, that means like, the underlying cryptography of how, you know, how the thing works is flawed in some way. Um, it's very easy to get that wrong. Um, it, there's an, an incorrect implementation of the design you've already written down. That's also very easy to do badly. Um, there's, a, there's a huge area encompassed by incorrectly implementing the design. And that's actually mostly what I, what I work on day to day is how do we make sure that we correctly implement our designs. Um, so that's a huge one all, all on its own. Uh, then you've just got the typical software mistakes that you see all the time that, that is the reason why you know, apps and your operating system and et cetera is, 
has updates all the time, security updates. Why are there security updates? Why are there security updates? It's because people built the system wrong in the first place. And in a cryptocurrency, any one of those could have been fatal to the system. Um, um, amateur cryptography. Amateur cryptography is like amateur brain surgery. <laughs> it's a really bad idea. People think that they can do it, and then you easily find, well, not easily, but someone who has, you know, wants to steal all your money finds a flaw in the, in the cryptography, and, and then that's it. Um, that happens more than you would imagine. Um, you can fail by missing performance deadlines. Cryptocurrencies involve things happening on a schedule. Like in, in Bitcoin, the schedule is every 10 minutes, so maybe that's easy. But in other systems, Ethereum, Cardano, there are tight deadlines. Things have to happen within 10 seconds or 20 seconds. And if it doesn't, things start to go wrong. Um, systems can collapse under load. You know, the system seems to work fine when you run it you know, with just a few users and, and falls apart when you run it with lots of users. Um, failure to scale, that is like, um, you know, it works fine when um, there's only a few nodes running the system, but when the nodes are far apart and there's lots of nodes, or there's high transaction rates, there's all kinds of dimensions of scaling, but systems can fail to scale um, and then be not useful because they didn't manage to scale to the, to the size that you wanted. Denial of service failures, people trying to attack your system, uh, there are economic attacks, there are social um, uh, problems. Like um, Bitcoin doesn't have any way of upgrading Bitcoin except through a no, no formal mechanism. I mean, there's, there's a sort of social process and that maybe seems to work, but it also sometimes gets jammed up. It, plausibly, you know, Bitcoin could fail because people are not able to agree to, to make changes and move forward. That's a failure of you know, some kind of social voting system. There's a lack of a voting system in, in Bitcoin. So maybe you need one. Um, so systems can fail due to that. Systems can fail due to macroeconomics. Um, so there's all, kinds of, there's all kinds of things, software related, non-software related, uh, that can cause the system to fail. Um, and yeah, I would like evidence that you know, the system that you're building, or in, rather the system I'm building, is not going to fail. And that's, that's quite hard. Um, yeah, hubris. Um, so cryptocurrencies are new things, and they do rely on a lot of new ideas. Um, and they rely on new cryptography, um, particularly like the proof of stake protocols rely on new cryptography. Um, and the, you know, everything after Bitcoin relies on, on new cryptography. Um, but it's kind of easy for people who have been building those kinds of systems to think that the rest of you know, the reality of rules of how the world works doesn't really apply to them anymore. You, you all know the, the, the story of Icarus, who, um, who flew too close, close to the sun, and uh, uh, eventually, you know, the, the, the wax melted, and uh, his, uh, his feathers started to fail, and he, he fell to earth. Because he, I mean, part of the story, I mean, there's many reasons, but part of the story is that he sort of didn't really believe that the rules applied to him anymore. And, and he got you know, too close to the sun, got too hot, but you know, that, that did eventually melt the wax and he fell to earth. And there's a little bit of a danger in that in the way that some of the cryptocurrencies have been built. I and mean, I'm sort of particularly thinking of Ethereum, actually. Um, so th there is a danger of ignorance and hubris. Um, uh, it, it's dangerous to believe that it's all new and that, that, that we don't need any of the old ideas. And actually, we need lots and lots and lots of the old ideas, as well as the new ideas, right? You need all of it. Um, so it's a mistake to believe that you can build a high quality system by being an expert only in cryptocurrencies. You need actually a large amount of, um, well, experts in different things. So you can't be an expert in all of these things. Um, I'm an expert in maybe two of these things. Um, so to build a cryptocurrency, you need cryptography, computer science, formal methods, programming languages, software engineering, system design, blah, 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 blah. And it goes on and on and on. Um, and all of these things are actually necessary, I think, or probably quite important. Um, I mean, the ones at the top are clearly critical. The ones towards the bottom are probably rather important. Um, and no one can be an expert in all of these things. So you need to have a team that has expertise, I think, in all of these things to be able to build a system, uh, to be able to build a modern cryptocurrency that is going to really work, that is going to be able to solve 
that's not going to be able to fail in all the ways that I described earlier. You need economists to make sure that the system doesn't fail due to economics. Um, you need game theorists to make sure that the microeconomic incentives work out. Um, you need people like me to make sure that the programming languages are any good. Um, things like that. And if you look at, if you look at things like Ethereum, I, I don't want to bash Ethereum too much, but um, it, you know, it's clear that it was built very quickly, and it was, you know, it was great, but just, you know, so I'm, I'm an expert in, in programming language technology. And so I look at Ethereum, and I see that the people who designed the EVM and the languages that run on the EVM had clearly never studied programming language technology. They'd never studied, there, there is a, there's a whole academic discipline of how do you design programming languages. And Solidity um, doesn't take advantage of any of that at all. Um, and there are consequences to that. So my point is that there's lots and lots of existing areas of study, of knowledge, that these systems, cryptocurrencies, have to make use of to really be great, to, to really work in all the aspects. Um, so the, the philosophy of development of Cardano is to try and use the best available academic knowledge and skills and to rely on expertise from all these different domains. Um, where, where necessary, um, do original research. Um, but in many cases, we can simply pick up existing knowledge that is known, you know, known within those particular disciplines, known within game theory or microeconomics or, uh, or formal methods. And then, of course, you know, because we have to deliver things to market, we have to get features out to users, you have to pick an appropriate trade-off between um, quality and delivering new features, getting things out. There is a, there is a trade-off, um, although it's not quite where one might imagine. So, okay, I'm just going to do a very brief history of, of, uh, of Cardano. Um, so the, the first code was written in um, the summer in 2016. Uh, the mainnet release was only one year after that, um, which was quite quick, really. I mean, the users were complaining because it wasn't quick enough. Um, but from my point of view as a, as a software engineer, as a programmer, um, that was quite quick. And I, I got involved about halfway through that process. Um, in, in March this year, we started doing rolling releases, and then we've done incremental. Uh, th these are the major releases. There's also been intermediate releases, smaller releases. So that's kind of a, you know, Cardano is still relatively young um, in that sense. Um, so another way of charting the history of Cardano is to look at uh, the exchanges that, that, use, uh, that support uh, Cardano. So when, when Cardano was first launched, when the mainnet was first launched, uh, there was just one exchange, uh, there was a second a few months later, and at the moment there's at least a dozen sort of tier one exchanges that have significant volume, um, and there are more that are integrating all the time. Um, in version 1.2, which was out, as I said, not so long ago, when was that? June. There's some new improvements to help uh, exchanges, and coming along shortly in the 1.4 release is a completely new um, wallet implementation that will uh, support exchanges, the, the, the scale at which exchanges have to operate. I'll come back to that point uh, uh, in a minute. So lessons that we have learned from, from launching uh, the mainnet. Um, so some things have worked really well. Uh, I'll get on to the what hasn't worked well in a minute. Um, so the core system has been stable. Um, it's been running 24-7. It is globally distributed uh, to survive like failures in particular data centers. And that has actually been important. There, we have observed with our monitoring system that you know, some of the you know, Amazon machines have lost connectivity with each other or been rebooted, failed for whatever reason. Um, you know, there have been outages beyond our control, but the system was completely stable throughout that because it was designed to be um, globally distributed and have proper fallover or failover. Um, we've had good system monitoring, so we've been able to see that it, that it works. 95% um, of transactions make it into the next block, so that, that's a sort of measure of how quickly transactions make it into the system. Um, and blocks, in our case, in Cardano, are 20 seconds, um, or slots are 20 seconds. And we can achieve quite good uh, throughput for exchanges uh, by using multi-output transactions, which is you know, the same as what Bitcoin does, but 
Um, it's good to see that it, it does actually happen. So those are the good things. So in, you know, by and large, that's, you know, that, that's been quite satisfying. Um, but uh, there's definitely things that, that you know, um, are not as good as you would hope. Um, and I, as an engineer, I tend to focus on the negative things. I focus on, like, you know, what, what do I need to fix? Not, not like, you know, what's great. What's great is, like, you know, that's yesterday. Uh, what, what, what I have to fix is what's in front of me. Um, so um, there's some obvious lessons that we, that we could draw from, from the mainlet launch. I mean, it was, as I said, developed quite quickly in, in the way that a lot of software is. Um, and so the performance requirements were not clearly understood at the beginning. Um, they needed to be better understood at the beginning. Performance engineering can't be left to the end. It has to be done much earlier. I mean, this, this hasn't been a problem too much. The, the, the scale at which Cardano is currently operating, we have about a factor of 50 headroom. But I can see that we could do a lot better. And there's, there's things that could have been done better. Um, and distributed concurrency networking are really hard. Um, you know, a lot of uh, presentations on cryptocurrencies are like, you know, this is easy, this is awesome. But, um, but actually, the engineering, the, the software, writing the software, making it work correctly, is very difficult. Distributed concurrency is a hard problem in computer science. Um, so a corollary of that is that hard problems require more formality. And I'll, I'll, I'll say what, that, what I mean by that. Um, more formal approaches in, in the development of software. So as an example, the, um, you know, every system needs a wallet, and Cardano has a wallet. Um, the, the wallet that we first deployed with um, proved to be good enough for desktop users, but not good enough for exchanges. Um, we had to do a lot of remedial work to make it just about acceptable for exchanges um, in the early months after the mainnet re release. Um, and it became obvious that um, it, it would be ne necessary to rewrite the wallet from scratch. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a bit more detail, because it gave us a good opportunity to, um, to do things better. And I'll show you how we've done that. Question? Can you talk about the numbers which are good enough for exchanges? What numbers are good enough for exchanges? Yeah. So, um, why, OK, why, why, why was the wallet not good enough for exchanges? I guess that's really your question. Yes, what are the exact numbers? How many transactions a second? Uh, you know, how many outputs a second uh, do they at, need? At certain times, embarrassingly, uh, exchanges were only managing to get like one, three transactions per minute, um, which is like, doesn't seem very good at all. Um, now... Uh, okay, wait, let me get this straight. So you're suggesting that... Uh, that's not the whole system, that's one exchange. Three transactions a minute is okay for a desktop user. Pretty much, yeah. Well, also remember that the desktop users do not have large wallets. So exchanges have very large wallets. And the performance for very large wallets was worse, much worse, much, much, much worse than for ordinary users. So an ordinary user with, with like, you know, 10 entries in their UTXO would have no problem doing, you know, multiple transactions per, per minute. But the, the, the way that the wallet was written, uh, it had those problems. It did not scale well at all. Um, so, it, you know, the core system worked very stably, but the wallet was actually not very good, um, you know. So, uh, what, in a, what other ways, ways was it bad? It was, yeah, basically it didn't scale. That, that was the main problem. The, the asymptotic complexity um, was poor. The management of um, data concurrently was poor. Um, um, it was written too quickly. I mean, I could go on and on about what was wrong with it. Okay, so uh, you say 1.4 solves that. So how many transactions a second, how many outputs a second can you do now in 1.4? 1 um, 1.4 is not released yet. And the new wallet is still is sort of about 90% done. So I, I can't give you those numbers yet. Um, but I anticipate that it'll be much better. And I can tell you why, right? I have evidence. Um, which I'll come to in a second, right? Because I will, I will talk in more detail about the wallet. So, yeah, the wallet was not very good for exchanges. It was okay for desktop users. Um, and so we decided to rewrite it from scratch and to, to take that opportunity to do things properly, at least properly in the way I see it, the way I would like to go about making software. So the way that we did this was by starting by making a semi-formal or formal specification. What, what is it that the wallet really has to do. So we wrote 
so I started writing a precise specification of what a wallet is. Um, and, and that's written in a, in a mathematical style, mathematical notation, mathematical logic, just set theory, in fact. And just do, the act of doing that, that kind of design process, forces you to think clearly about what it is you're doing and to simplify as much as possible. One of the problems with original wallet design was that it had a, accumulated complexity that was not essential. And if you talk to software developers, they will tell you that accidental complexity is like the worst thing. You need to make things as simple as possible. But making things simple as possible is actually quite hard. It requires a lot of thinking. Um, so writing down these things in a mathematical style forces you to think about this stuff, and it highlights the, the, tricky, parts of the, the tricky parts of the problem, which might not have been immediately obvious previously that they were even problems at all. Uh, and I'll, I'll give an example in a second. Um, and then you, you could try and prove things, um, and, and we have done that in our, in our wallet specification. Um, I'll come back to what this means in a second. Um, so the, 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 the point about writing down a specification in this mathematical style is, yes, it makes you think clearly. Um, you can't get away with... Uh, you can't get away with fuzzy thinking, right? It forces you to be precise. Um, and to, to think clearly and logically and to write it down. Um, and then you, you can use that. You can, you can try and prove things about it. But in fact, we don't, we don't actually prove things. We, we state properties and then we test them. And th this is what makes it semi-formal compared to what a mathematician would do. A mathematician would prove things about uh, a presentation like this. Whereas, because we're doing this in what I call a semi-formal style, this is this trade-off between how quickly you can implement something and how good it's going to be. You know, the, the golden standard would be proof, but it's a lot quicker to state the properties and then test them. Um, and that's, that's the approach that we've taken. And, and taking this approach, um, in my experience, leads to dramatically simpler uh, um, programs and more robust programs. Um, do, doing the, the, the exercise we went through eliminated huge areas of accidental complexity in the original specification. So, this, sorry, uh, this, is, this is one page out of the 40-page like, formal specification of the, of the wallet. But I don't expect you to see it all. It's, it's you know, slightly too small. But the point is, this is more or less the entire specification of what it is to be a cryptocurrency wallet in one page. And that is actually quite an achievement, to get something down to being that small and that simple and to being that mathematically precise. And that's quite unusual in the way that software is built. But in my book, that is the way to do it. Go on, another question. Sorry, I'll, I'll repeat the question as well. So, uh, I, I'm wondering, you, have, you seem to have one balance. So There's two balances, actually. All There's right. an available balance and a total balance. Okay. And in the end, we end up with three balances. Um, okay, but how about things like you know, HD wallets? And yeah, this, this describes HD wallets as well. Yeah. Okay, so... Uh, In fact, this is agnostic to whether it's an HD wallet or not. Uh, okay, it's, but it's this abstract. describes just one address of the HD wallet. No, no, it describes the entire wallet. So it's, it's a UTXO-based wallet, so it oh. describes a set of addresses. Um, yeah, it, so it, it is definitely UTXO-based. Um, so okay. it can be single address, would be an instance of this, but an HD wallet would be another instance of it. Okay, then... Uh, well, it seems so this, very... is, this is published online, if you would like to go and read it. Okay. Um, it's, it's, our, it's our formal specification. Um, and it, it, if, you, if you are a mathematician, or you know, you've done a bit of mathematics at, at you know, sort of undergraduate level, you could look at this and you could see what it means. It's not actually all that complicated. It's just set theory, finite, func finite relations, functions, um, sets. Um, it's not very complicated. Is this formal specification online too? Yes, yes, this, oh, okay. this document's online. Yeah, uh, it's on the Cardano Docs website. Um, and this is the specification for our new wallet. Now, okay, let me get to our next. Um, so having a specification is nice, but you also need to then have an implementation, and then you have to have some evidence that your implementation and your specification do the same thing, that, that one is an implementation of the other. So uh, here's a commuting diagram. Uh, hands up the three people in the audience who know what that means. One, two... Three, ah, oh, that was a good guess. Oh, four or five, okay, fine, good. 
for the rest of you, I will explain what it means. Um, but the, 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 the takeaway from this is that this approach to writing a specification and then testing against that specification gives you an order of magnitude more confidence in the design that you've done. Partly it's because you started with a simple design, you were forced to by having to write it down in your mathematical notation, and secondly by testing it against the specification in this fairly comprehensive way. Uh, we can be quite sure, not, not 100%, testing never gives you more than, never gives you 100%, it's not as good as proof, but testing gives you, in this style, gives you quite good evidence uh, that your implementation does what your specification says it should do. So let me just explain how this works. So you have um, a specification that came from the paper. So that was, that was this stuff. Where has it gone? Uh, this, this is described in, in, in mathematics, in set theory. But the way that we wrote this was deliberately so that it could be very easily converted into... Um, a program. In particular, it's very easy to convert this into a functional language program, in particular Haskell, um, because Haskell is a very mathematical style of language. I mean, a lot of these things are basically functions, um, and so it's very easy to translate that into, into, into Haskell, into a functional language. And what does that give us? That gives us an executable specification, a specification that we can run as a program, because it is, in fact, a Haskell program. These things translate into Haskell functions. And so then that gives us a, you know, a version of what we're trying to do that is, that is abstract, it is simpler. Abstraction is all about getting rid of the details that don't matter and focusing on the details that are essential. So the, the, the wallet specification doesn't include anything about cryptography. It doesn't include anything about HD wallets. It only, it only has the idea that you have a set of addresses. But how that set works, it doesn't, it doesn't care about. It focuses on the... What I thought was the hardest things, which was based on my opinion, having looked at the old wallet and seen, you know, what did it do badly, trying to focus on what were the hard problems. So the, ad, so the, the, the specification, you know, glosses over particular details deliberately. So it's less complex than the real implementation. So how do we relate to the real implementation, which has all of the inherent, you know, complexities, it has to do all the cryptography, et cetera, et cetera. How do we relate that to the, to the specification? Well, the, the answer is by an abstraction function. The abstraction function goes from the complex to the simple. It strips out the details and gives you back the, um, the same value, but in the, in the simpler representation. So what do I mean by that concretely? So for example, you would have, for the wallet, you'd have the state of the wallet, which in the real implementation might be a database, uh, or a database plus some additional information in memory and some files and whatever. Um, so that is the state of the wallet in the real implementation. The, the abstraction function re translates that into the, the simple set theory style um, description of the wallet, which was just in terms of a, you know, some set theoretic description of a UTXO. Um, it, it turns out it's a, a pending set and a UTXO. That's all you need. Um, so the abstraction function goes from one to the other and it, and it gives you that simpler version. Um, so now the idea is that we can start with the state of a wallet down in this corner and we can run certain operations on the wallet, on the real implementation of the wallet and get to a new state of the wallet over here. So what might those operations be? They might be things like new blocks arriving or new transactions being created. Those are, those are the kinds of things that that the real implementation will do and get you from one state of the wallet to a new state of the wallet. In each state of the wallet, you can apply the abstraction function to get a corresponding state in the abstract version that, that is described as part of the specification. And then you run the, the equivalent functions in the abstract version. So for example, um, I don't, it's maybe slightly hard to see here, but uh, apply block is one of the, um, the operations on the wallet that it changes the state of the wallet when a new block arrives. Right? It, you, know, you notice that your balance might have increased because someone paid you something, for example. Um, or new pending is another transition. So the, the, the operations down here have corresponding things in the specification, apply block, new pending. And so then the idea is that you, you do one here and you apply the abstraction function, you get to another value at the top, and you, or you start at the beginning and you say apply the abstraction function first and apply the operations at the level of the abstraction and you should get the same answer. And if you do, 
this is a correct implementation of that, if that is true for all possible operations and states of the wallet. And then what you do is you generate random sequences of operations on the wallet, starting from an empty wallet, and that gives you really quite good coverage of, of this. Um, in principle, you'd have to prove this to be true for every single possible sequence of actions, and we don't do that, but we test with randomly generated, large numbers of randomly generated sequences of operations. Does that make any sense? Yes. Someone said yes at the back. Um, so this, this gives you really quite good evidence that your implementation does what the specification says it does. And if your specification is simple... Sorry, there is a question here. Go on, question. Okay. Yeah, I'm just wondering, so it seems that you can just screw up your abstraction function and, and get the whole thing wrong in the sense, so if you don't do that, you can screw up your real implementation and have problems, but if you do use this community diagram and you screw up your abstraction function, then you get into the same problems. So is it easier to write the abstraction function, or how do you know it's the right one? Uh, how do you know that you've done the abstraction function right? Um, you can also write the opposite one, and check that the two of them um, are proper inverses of each other. Uh, and it's true, you, you can make mistakes in the abstraction function. Um, but it's quite likely that if you do, you'll, you'll catch it when you, when you do the later simulation, that, that something will not match up properly. Um, but it's, it's true, it is technically possible to get that wrong. Um, th this is why this is not a completely formal you know, proof method. Um, so, uh uh, sec so just a second, I will just... Sorry, I, I can repeat the question as well for everybody ah. and, for the, and for the recording. Go on, ask <laughs> no, a question. Okay. So, of course, there's uh, model-driven development, uh, which has uh, opposite uh, directions of arrows, so you kind of generate code and... and uh, this is not about generating code. This is yeah, about this is the values. opposite. This is the kind of opposite because... Yeah. Um, uh, I, I believe at one point there was a decision to uh, to produce uh, the protocol in Haskell, um, among many other possibilities of how to guarantee a high quality code, because this is of course uh, there's plethora of solutions there. Yeah. Uh, and um, my question would be, um, how uh, does the choice of um, the programming language actually uh, um, affect how you deal with performance, the problems with performance? With with performance? Yeah. With performance, Coming back to the other slide, actually. Yeah. Um, with performance, um, not so much. Um, uh, the language doesn't matter quite so much. Um, because performance is really about um, analyzing what you're doing. Um, so, I mean, for example, we can actually think about performance at the level of this specification already. Um, one of the next chapters here is, uh, well, actually, there we are. This is, this is the asymptotic complexity um, of all of the operations in the basic version of the specification. And, and then in like a ne next version, we change it to, where's it gone? Uh, well, we notice that it's not great, and then we do some refinements and then get something where the asymptotic complexity is, is better. For, for this problem, the absolute performance doesn't matter too much. What's critical is the asymptotic complexity. So the original wallet, you know, was accidentally you know, it had terrible performance not because, you know, it was written in Haskell. It had terrible performance because um, they were doing things which were linear, which could have been logarithmic, right? It, it, so, you know, the computer science, first year computer science, where you study asymptotic complexity, that's actually really important. And you have to do that kind of analysis and then discover that the asymptotic complexity is not what you wanted and then fiddle around with it until it is. You know, you cache the right thing and then you show that the asymptotic complexity is, now it's n log n. And like, that's great. You know, the exchanges are not going to have problems when, when there's, you're doing something that's you know, n log n in the size of their wallet, uh, whereas they are if it's quadratic. Um, um, yeah, yes, of course, you, you need to handle asymptotic complexity first. But um, this is uh, about how you pose the problem, actually, which uh, I believe this specification uh, very much helps to reduce the asymptotic complexity. Yeah. But if you want to speed up something uh, 10 times, uh, the constant of complexity is important, and that's uh, yep. actually the issue, uh, I guess, uh, which you are solving. Uh, uh, ultimately, you, you have to have good constants too, yeah. But, but number one is get the asymptotics right, because if you get that wrong, you know, nothing will save you. Um, 
and that, that was the problem with the performance of the old wallet. So um, I am really not too worried at all about the performance of the new wallet because I know that all of the things are, um, you know, the asymptotic complexity is sensible and the constants are going to be fine because it's just using, you know, Haskell's finite map library and that's pretty good. Um, it's not doing anything that's particularly uh, unusual there. All right, all right thank, thank you. you. Any other questions on all this um, formal nonsense? All right. So a closely related issue is that um, you can't just go and, like with the wallet, we decided it was actually worth rewriting from scratch. But you can't do that with everything. Um, I mean, the system is a lot bigger than just the wallet. Um, so, you know, we have to balance, you know, if, if I had my way, I would say, like, all right, let's not do any new features and let's just rewrite everything, right? But that, that's not okay, you know, for, from the point of view of users and, um, you know, it has to, be a, has to be a balance. So how do we manage this trade-off between trying to do things you know, in a way that I would say, you know, is a, is a good way that produces evidence of high quality, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and get new features out to, to users at the same time? Um, and, well, it's tricky um, to, to strike that balance. Um, what we are doing uh, at the moment is, um, as part of delivering the decentralization uh, and particularly the delegation features um, in, in the system, we are taking that as an opportunity to introduce um, you know, more formality um, and more executable, executable specifications, much like what we've done from the wallet, but doing it for you know, existing code that we are you know, in the process of changing. So we're trying to do sort of both things at the same time. Um, and that's mm, tricky, but you know, um, it, it lets us balance that, that, that trade-off of delivering new features while at the same time trying to improve the quality to you know, much better than industry standard. Um, right, okay. I don't know, what am I, how's, how am I doing for time? Just go on. Just go on. All right. So tell me when to stop because I mean, I, I, there's features I could talk about forever and ever. There's, uh, there's quite a lot of stuff. So the, the biggest thing, I guess, that we're working on at the moment and the thing that everyone's most keen on, uh, keen on seeing um, done and out and released, um, is, is decentralization. Um, so as I'm sure anyone who's you know, looked at Cardano before will, will know that Cardano in its first release is, is federated, but not decentralized. Federated meaning that, you know, that the, it's operated by IOHK, Cardano Foundation, and Demergo. Um, and it's not you know, a fully decentralized um, system yet, um, but it will be. Um, so decentralization for Cardano involves mechanisms to, to delegate stake. Uh, it involves incentives for people to operate stake pools. Stake pools are by analogy with mining pools. They're not the same, but that's kind of the analogy. Um, there has to be incentives to delegate uh, to stake pools. I'll get on to what delegation means if you've not come across it before. And there also has to be uh, for proper decentralization, decentralization of the network. So a proper, robust, worldwide, peer-to-peer -peer, um, network layer. And those are all the things that we are working on at the moment. And I'll go into a bit more detail on each of them. Um, so for delegation and incentives. So Ouroboros um, has always been designed as a, as a decentralized um, you know, cryptocurrency uh, blockchain protocol. Um, yeah, strictly speaking, Ouroboros is not a cryptocurrency, but a, but a blockchain. Um, um, but so although it has always been designed as being decentralized, to, to do that in practice means you have to do quite a lot of other things. Um, I mean, the original Ouroboros paper did describe uh, delegation, but uh, yeah, question here? Sorry for interrupting you because uh, you Sorry? just explained a scheme, uh, all the blockchain uh, of yours uh, is a braiding, right? And, Sorry, um, say that again. I mean, the blockchain, the, the model of your blockchain operates, right? I'm trying to realize uh, it is public or private. It's public. Public, right. Or at least once it's decentralized, then it's properly public. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, in this case, uh, if you have a, a federation, right? Currently, It is yeah. uh, permissioned or permissionless. So technically, currently, you would say that it would be permissioned because, permissioned. because it's federated. Mm -hmm. um, but the design of Ouroboros is to be a public blockchain. Oh, yeah. And the decentralization is about delivering that for real. So basically for the end user, right? Uh, to join a, a blockchain uh, of yours. Oh, oh, for end users, it's completely 
permissionless. Okay. It, it's for people who are creating blocks, but mm -hmm. it's currently permissioned, if you like. There's like three, three okay. you know, organizations. What, what in case of an enterprise uh, entity who wants to join a project, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it is still to, um, to be uh, permissioned by you, by the foundation, right? To join all the uh, all blockchain network, right? Uh, no, no, I mean, anyone can join the network. But at the moment, only three entities can create blocks. Uh -huh. And with decentralization, then anyone can take part in that. And that, that makes it then fully decentralized. But if you want to integrate with Cardano or, you know, there's no permission required for that. Um, okay, thank you very much. It's clear. Yeah. So, so, yeah, so as I said, Ouroboros, the underlying blockchain technology um, protocol is designed by the, uh, the academics, researchers uh, who work for IOHK, um, has always been designed to be decentralized. But actually doing it in practice turns out to be um, harder than it looks. Um, so we've ended up having to write a new research paper on the mechanisms to do delegation beyond what was in the original Ouroboros paper. Um, importantly, a, a paper on the incentives design. How do you make sure that the incentives work out properly? And I'll, I'll talk about that more in a second. And then an engineering design for both of these things. An engineering design that covers how to do delegation and incentives um, based on what the researchers have worked out. And, and this turned out to take a long time. It, it proved to be quite tricky, quite subtle, um, and it required lots of iterations going round and round, because um, there's some quite difficult trade-offs. There's, no, like, there's no one clear solution that just satisfies all the requirements. There are a lot of requirements for, for decentralization and, and incentives that kind of pull, pull <coughs> against each other. So delegation, let me just summarize how this is going to work um, one, once it's released. So um, this, this is, you know, so Cardano is based on a UTXO model, much like Bitcoin. Um, so addresses in this context are the same style of addresses as in Bitcoin, which is a bit different from uh, accounts in Ethereum. So addresses in, in Cardano are associated with the stake keys. Um, so every, you, you know, your, your money goes along with your stake. In, in Cardano and in proof-of-stake protocols, the idea is if you own you know, value, you own a corresponding stake. And the stake gives you the right to take part in the proof-of-stake protocol. So um, in, in the delegation system, addresses are associated with stake keys, and those stake keys get registered on the chain. The stake keys have a corresponding reward account, and that's what's used to pay uh, rewards. And that that itself turned out to be really quite tricky to get that to work right. Um, to get the asymptotic complexity of paying out rewards turned out to be much harder than you would imagine. Uh, I can tell you about it if you care. Um, stake keys then delegate to a stake pool. Um, and it is only the stake pools that take part in the proof of stake protocol. But if you want to do self-staking, run your own pool, then that's what you do. You just run your own pool. And that pool can be private. Um, so if you really want to, you can run um, you can take part in the proof of stake protocol you know, on, your, on your home machine, um, at least provided you've got a good enough network connection. And then these staking rewards get paid out into these um, reward accounts. Um, and, and that happens completely automatically. It does not depend on whether the stake pool that you've delegated to is cooperative or not. The system does it fully automatically. Uh, and it pays out rewards to the people who run the stake pools and it pays out rewards to people who join the stake pools. So um, that's the intuition behind there being an incentive to run a stake pool or an incentive to join a stake pool. Why should I bother delegating? Because you'll get money, right? That's why. So that, that's the basics of how delegation itself will work. Um, so obviously, you know, it'll be possible to run a stake pool and then just through Daedalus or whatever, it'll be possible to delegate to, a, to your choice of stake pool or to your own stake pool. The incentives, um, incentives are really tricky. Um, a good incentive scheme requires um, a lot of analysis and a lot of careful design um, with expertise that I don't have. Um, it, it, you require expertise in, in mechanism design or microeconomics or game theory to, to design one of these incentive schemes and be confident that it will do what you want it to do. Right? It's easy to design an incentive scheme which says, like, you know, so-and-so gets paid so much money when something happens. 
but, but trying to show that that incentive scheme has the outcomes that you want, that is hard. Right? That's where you require game theory to say, you know, the, the Nash equilibrium or the stable equilibriums of this game are the kind of outcomes that we want and not the kind of outcomes we don't want. Right? So I, I won't go through exactly how that incentive scheme works, but I'll give you the goals and a sort of very quick intuition. And you can ask me afterwards if you've got lots of questions about it. So the design goals are to incentivize people to operate stake pools and for people to join stake pools, right? because both are necessary to make the system work. Um, in, in case it wasn't clear to people um, who have not come across proof of stake before, um, proof of stake in, in its simplest incarnation relies on everybody taking part. And that's not really practical, because if I'm running you know, Cardano or if, if I were running a, a naive proof of stake protocol on my phone, I, I can't in practice take part in proof of stake all the time because you know, it's not going to be on or not going to be connected to the network. So the whole idea with, with proof of stake is that you, uh, to, make it, to make it work practically, you have to be able to delegate your rights to take part in the protocol to somebody else, someone who is online, someone who is operating a server. Um, so there have to be incentives for people to delegate because if nobody delegates, the system will fall apart. There will be no one to create blocks. So it's critical that people delegate, just as critical as that there are people to delegate to. It's the combination of those two that, that has to happen. There needs to be a reasonable number of stake pools. And that means not too many, not too few. But particularly not too few. Right? If you look at Bitcoin or Ethereum or several of the other systems that are out there, you'll see that actually they're remarkably centralized for decentralized cryptocurrencies. Bitcoin has five major mining pools, which control, you probably know better than I do, some vast proportion of the um, hashing power in the system. Um, Ethereum, I, I don't know the numbers for Ethereum, um, but as I understand it, most of these systems have actually quite a small number of nodes that are actually really creating most of the blocks. And the equivalent in our system is, is the stake pools. So you don't want a, a centralization collapse where everybody joins the same stake pool uh, and you end up with only five like in Bitcoin or, or worse, only one, right? That would be a disaster. So the design of the incentive mechanism tries to make sure that the, that the number of stake pools does not collapse, that there is not an incentive for stake pools to merge. There's, there should be an incentive for them to merge sometimes, but not, not so many, not merging so much that the number of stake pools collapses. So in fact, this, the, the incentive mechanism has a, uh, a goal parameter um, that says how many stake pools there should be. And that, that parameter is adjustable. We get, we get to pick that parameter. Or we as the, you know, the system, people voting on how the system works, get to set that parameter. Um, and the, the proofs and the simulations show that the Nash equilibrium turns out to be that number of stake pools. So that's like you know, a good result. Um, the system, when it's stable, when, when it, when it reaches an equilibrium, will have a decent number of stake pools. Um, so there is not, a, there's not an incentive for them all to just merge. Um, uh, and so, yeah, we have a research paper that, that explains this with proofs that show natural equilibriums, et cetera, et cetera. And we also have simulations, which sometimes can try out scenarios that are too hard to prove. Um, and the, the general idea is it's based on competition between stake pools, um, competition for people to join the stake pool. So different stake pools are trying to like, you know, give you the best returns, and that, that's how they compete with each other. But the, the way that stake pools themselves get, you know, the, the rewards that the stake pools themselves get is partly based on their size, and, that, and that's what lets us um, stop stake pools getting too large. Um, um, yeah, tell me, tell me when I should stop, because I can, I can go on and on. Um, <laughs> Go on, question, question right here. All right, so how do you prevent uh, an actor from actually no Sybil attacking? Aha, that's polls? an excellent question. How do you, you prevent know, just, Sybil attacks? Uh, just do two polls and ask how? people to join poll A. Yes, and B. yes. Yeah. So, how, so, so the idea of a Sybil attack is that you know, I could uh, create multiple identities because on the internet nobody knows that you're a dog, and I could go and set up you know, 100 different stake pools. And, and thereby, and try and try and trick everybody into joining my hundred stake pools, uh, and then in fact it's only me who controls all the stake, 
and then, I don't know, profit or something. I, I don't know. I don't know what the point of that would be, but, you know. So the, 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 spent, the idea of a Sybil attack is multiple identities hiding behind, like, virtual identities. And how do you stop that? The, the, the general solution to these kinds of Sybil attacks is that there has to be some kind of scarce resource that's used up. So, you know, like in, in proof of work, the scarce resource is like computational power that can't be duplicated. So for, um, let me go back a slide. So for, for stake pools, the, the scarce resource that we use is stake, right? So we say that um, when you register a stake pool, there is a slight difference in the rewards that a stake pool will get depending on how much stake the stake pool owner contributes to that stake pool. So that means that, you know, if you get a bunch of people who get together to form a coalition to, to make a stake pool, they can probably get the amount of stake that they would need to get an optimal return. And so the, the point is that stake pools that have had their owners, which can be multiple people, pledge a large amount of stake to their stake pool, they can get a slightly better return for them and for all of their members. And that means that they can become a successful, a competitive stake pool. Whereas if I start a stake pool and I don't give any stake to that stake pool, I will not be able to make a competitive stake pool in practice. I mean, I can, I can, I can do it, I can try, but it would always be better for someone to join one of the different stake pools that had a better return. And it only has to be a slight difference for people to switch. And then the, then the point is that I can't put my same stake to create multiple different stake pools. You know, if I, if I pledge a certain amount of stake to this stake pool, the system doesn't let me you know, duplicate it and put the same stake into a different stake pool. And so that's the scarce resource that prevents too much in the way of civil attacks. Um, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. So that, that's all part of the game theory. That's what's all the stuff you have to think about with uh, getting this right. Yeah, question at the back here. Yeah, so I'm, I'm no, I don't know much about proof of stake mechanisms, but in proof of work, very, things can get screwed over. I mean, so game theory is nice in mathematics, but in, I, I took uh, some game theory courses, and eventually it's a model. And in the beginning of the course, they tell you that the model does not always reflect what happens in reality, which means that eventually it may happen that you, you, one big pool takes over. In proof of work, there is a recovery, a recovery mechanism. You have to control the scarce source, uh, source for a resource for a long time. And if you stop doing that, or the good actors gain more resources, they can take over the good chain. In proof of stake, I'm not sure what happens if actually some bad actor takes over. What's the recovery mechanism, if any, exists? So, OK. So um, the, the, the basic idea with uh, you know, how much adversarial power is required to take over the network is very similar between proof of stake and proof of work. So in proof of work, you need to control 50% you know, or over 50% of the hashing power in the system to, to take it over. And if you control, you know, if there were only, you know, if there was one stake pool, sorry, one mining pool that controlled 50% of the hashing power, that would be it. They, they would control the whole system. Um, uh, yes, they, they, have to, they have to control that, state, that, that hashing power over, over some number of blocks. Um, it's not very different here. Um, so here, um, the system would collapse if an adversary controlled 50% of the stake which is you know, equivalent to the 50% of the hashing power. And the proof of that is in the, is in the academic papers. Um, so we need to make sure that our incentive mechanism does not uh, you know, accidentally encourage a situation where you know, one stake pool uh, controls 50% of the stake. And that's exactly what the, the mechanism tries to do. Uh, and and the, the proofs and the simulations show that the equilibrium, um, that it's an unstable equilibrium to have a very large stake pool that stake pool will actually split and, and people will leave that large stake pool because they'll get better returns in smaller stake pools. Um, so that's why one should imagine that you wouldn't get this you know, collapsing into just a small number of stake pools um, scenario. Does that answer the question? I was asking more about what happens, I mean, the recovery. So how, do, how do you recover? How do you so I understand that it really makes it impossible to happen, but it can happen. So how, how would you recover if this did happen? Uh, that's a good question, and I, I don't know. Um, 
That, that's outside of the assumptions that they make in the paper. I, I would go and ask the researchers exactly that question. What happens when these assumptions fail? Um, and how likely are they to fail? I mean, that, those, are, those are very sensible questions to ask about a system like this. Um, another, another question right here? Yeah, go on. I feel like a very hot debate in the proof of stake world now is as preventing basically double staking uh, or you know uh, with proof of work you actually burn the work and with stake when you get chosen when you get the chance to actually mine the block or stake the block uh, you can stake two different versions of it and then try to use it to you know um, double spend or something like that can you talk about how how Cardano prevents this so th this is how Ouroboros works. Um, so yes, in principle, someone who is the current slot leader uh, could create two different blocks and send them out to different people. Um, and so for a short time, there'll be a fork. Some, some people will see one block and some people will see another block. But just like in Bitcoin, um, you know, after a while, after a certain number of blocks deep, um, that becomes extraordinarily unlikely. And the proofs of that are in the paper. So in exactly the same way that in Bitcoin, um, it's very unlikely to have, the people are highly likely to agree on blocks that are you know, six blocks deep or 10 blocks deep or 20 blocks deep. The same is true in, proof of, in the proof of stake in Ouroboros. And the proofs of that are, are in the peer reviewed literature. Yes, sure, but the problem is, you know, if you, it you costs... want an intuition as to why. I mean, now I can just tell you it's been proven, uh, but you sort of want to know, well, so, uh, what, give me an intuition. Why is that the case? Is that what you mean? Uh, well, I haven't read the proofs, so no, no, no. obviously Fair I enough. cannot, I cannot, uh, you know, know what the proofs actually prove. Uh, well, I, but I can tell you what the proofs prove. Okay. I mean, how the proofs work is very difficult. Yeah, sure. But, but the statement of the, 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 the theorem is actually very simple. So there are two theorems, and they're exactly the same ones as people have proved for Bitcoin. So the theorem is, the first theorem is um, persistence. So once a block is somewhat deep in the, in the, in the chain, it, it is stable um, to a very, very, very high degree of probability. Uh, and the degree of probability depends on how deep it is in the chain. And that's the same as in Bitcoin. And the other property is liveness, that um, so long as 50% you know, of uh, hashing power or stake is, is honest, obeys the protocol correctly, then it will always be possible to make progress, to add new transactions, to create new blocks, to incorporate new transactions. So those are the same properties that Bitcoin and um, Ouroboros have. Um, uh, well, you know, there's uh, um, the whole idea is not for a fork in the blockchain to, to let accelerate uh, you know, the main branch, which everybody follows. That's how a double spend could be performed, right? And uh, in proof of work, uh, there's a cost for you know getting this fork on the side done. Here you can theoretically, uh, you know, just prepare multiple versions. Then you, you, your party can get the leader on one of those versions, and it costs you, nothing. You so can only do that if you control a very very high percentage of the stake. You know, near or over 50% of the stake. To to get to get those double spends deep in the, in the chain, similarly deep to how, you know, in, as in Bitcoin, you would need far more stake than you can actually achieve. So it, it, has, the same, it has the same persistence property as Bitcoin. Um. All right, let's, co let's continue that later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Of course. Thanks for so the answer. I, mean, I, can, I can certainly wrap up right now. Yeah, um, maybe. And then if anyone else has any more questions, then we can, yeah. you know, talk over I've got, a beer. I've got lots of supplementary oh. material. But it doesn't matter. I mean, they, <laughs> these are all optional topics. You know, I'm, I'm happy to be questioned about these things later. I'll tell you how fast the internet is. It's not very fast. <laughs> all right, let's wrap up there. Thank you very much. Oh, wow. Thanks.